Um, okay, so I want to start with asking you, what were you doing pre-Crown Affair? Because obviously I know you were like, you have so much experience building brands and like working at these incredible brands, but tell everyone what you were doing. So I started my career, I went to NYU and I started my career in 2012 at Into the Gloss. No big deal. I was an intern. <laughs> I like cold emailed Emily and Nick at the time. It was a relatively baby website, way pre-Glossier, which mm-hmm. I always clarify for people. It was definitely like a glimmer in their eye, but it was just the best time on the internet when like Tumblr was still really a thing. And I don't know, it was such a cool point of discovery. I feel like that's actually where I fell in love with beauty. I never thought I'd end up in beauty, so it's kind of a funny full circle thing. Wait, were you and Carrie there at the same time? No, Carrie was after me. That is so crazy. A glorious array of humans came after me, and I'm so grateful because we kind of have that like tethered overlap. The only person I overlapped with is an amazing person named Kim Johnson, Mm -hmm. who ended up building out the community for Glossier, and she now runs Geneva. She's, oh, she runs. Gen- okay. She's like the first hire there. She's like been there for a long time. Maybe and I need to have her on. Kim's the amazing. <laughs> we were both interns at the same time, and then I left and went to a company called Spring, which was a mobile shopping app, mm-hmm. not Spring Place, but it was a mobile shopping app called Spring. It was the first ever like mobile shopping app D to C. We had over three hundred brands on the platform. It was the early days of D to C. Warby, Harry's, Everlane. Oh my God. Everybody, the golden age. Voice, the golden age. It was 2013. We launched it. I was brought on by a woman named Era Katz, who's the founder of Seed. Mm-hmm. Okay, which you know, yeah. So she was one of the co-founders, and she um, she brought me on was my mentor. That was I just learned. Ev- that's actually where I became obsessed with e-commerce, mm-hmm. which. When I went to NYU, like everybody else, I'd like seen the Devil Wears Prada and like thought I wanted to work at Condé Nast. And just the reality of the time by like by when I graduated, it was just like the Internet was real. The writing was on the wall. And I loved just like community online, e-commerce online. Again, it was like very early days. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's where I learned about like Shopify, Magento, Demandware, top of funnel I worked with an all engineer team like that team actually ended up a lot of the UX and UI team ended up going to Instagram shop before they even announced the launch of Instagram shop so it was like super sad just an incredible team April Uchitel who's out here in LA she was the CEO of Violet Gray for Mm -hmm. a bit also an amazing brand curator it was just like an epic group of people in the early yeah, days of yeah i mean this is insane i feel like everyone was so connected and obviously like new york has always like no matter what industry it's like always kind of a hub for like early stage brands and like the cool factor that's about yeah. to hit so <laughs> that is insane yeah and it was like interesting too because you were starting to see the early signs of influencer as we know it now like all caps influencer it was like you know, you had the people who had their blogs or people like Leandra with Man Repeller, and it was a very exciting time. It was super casual. Like, you would, like, meet up with someone on the street, throw a sweatshirt on them, take a photo. Like, it wasn't this massive structured world. And even with Into the Gloss, like, the interviews, it was starting to be this blurring of, like, what is somebody who makes content online versus a celebrity? Um, And I feel like that was when so much power started to go to the creator and the storytellers online. It was a very cool time. And I I really just fell in love with consumer brands. I got to work with so many founders. And from spring, I worked with Tamara Mellon, Mm -hmm. who was the founder of Jimmy Choo. And she wanted to launch her own luxury direct consumer brand. So I actually came out here to LA for a couple months. And it was, I fell in love with LA. It was like 2015, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, Worked with her to make her visual literacy of like sexy, cool, female, 1970s Helmut Newton vibe and translate that. So you like helped kind of see like where that brand was going and like how it was launching. Yes. That's wild. She's an icon. Like she built Jimmy Choo. And like it's such a it it was such a eye opening moment of it was the first time I ever worked with like budgets of a certain scale or hiring photographers like Paula Kadaki, like just very like full print page and Vogue kind mm-hmm. of vibe, which as we all know is not the D2C yeah, e-commerce no. internet <laughs> world at all. I feel like my prior life was like, let's get some poster board and like take a photo on our iPhone. And it was like a full on situation. But I learned so much from her, that full go to market strategy. And then I ended up taking a job at Away, the luggage company. Um, Like, literally landed on a flight from L.A. The next Thursday, got coffee with Jen and Steph. I started my job on a Monday. Was this when Away was still fairly young? Yes, it was. I was the eighth employee. (gasps) Yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. It was amazing, honestly. It was such an incredible job. It's to this day, outside of Crown Affair, my favorite job I ever had in Uh the sense of my roles, responsibilities, KPIs, doing partnerships, building out Influencer. I was there for a year. 
Um, and then I decided to start my own consulting agency because there was just a lot of opportunity. Brands were coming to me to be like, how do you set up influencer and affiliate ambassador programs? How do you, you know, structure these partnerships? Like whether at a way I did partnerships with everybody from the MBA and Madewell and Carly Kloss and Rashida Jones and minions with universal like it was just such a range and it's actually been so funny seeing all the barbie partnerships roll out yeah, right now it's wild because my team was like well, how do they do this and i was like i don't obviously i don't know the details it's a different time but i love thinking about how all these things are structured in terms of like rev share upfront budget like whatever it is and how these go to markets go out so that's what i was doing it away and i feel like i just learned so much like mm-hmm. when i started there it was like Blue Smart and Raiden and like brands you don't know about today because they don't exist. And then just building this whole lifestyle universe um, is really fun. And then, yeah, built my brand agency, Levitate. That's what I very blessed. I got the Forbes 30 under 30 for that. Um, was working with Harry's. I launched their women's line, Flamingo. Mm-hmm. Worked with Outdoor Voices and Ty and that team to build their influencer ambassador strategy. Worked with a very cool menswear line, Buck Mason, mm-hmm. who's based yeah. out here. We Nish love- wears exclusively <laughs> their t-shirts. Like anytime you see him, he's in a t-shirt, it's Buck Mason. By the way, side note, obsessed with Nish. Your husband <laughs> is literally the nicest human. You guys are so adorable. Thank you. you guys, Sif had me over for dinner at her beautiful home and Nish was like in, I don't know, he was somewhere working and then like came out and I was like, who is this love? Lovely, <laughs> joyful human. You guys are so sweet together. Thank you. It's really beautiful to see. He's, uh, I first I'm like so lucky that I get to work with him too, yeah. but he's constant entertainment. Like <laughs> I laugh so hard every day. And so anytime I even have girlfriends over, he's like, he's so easy to get along with everyone. He's the best. He was just hanging out. He, I love, he's just so earnest. He is. And I just love, it's refreshing in this day and age to meet people who are like genuinely curious Good listeners. He doesn't care. He'll ask anything. He's All of just the like good, curious mind. You know. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So I was out here a lot with Buck Mason, Yumi, a baby food company, and I did that for a little over two years. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, like when you're building other people's businesses, you like keep giving a little bit of your special and your magic and your relationships. And there was just a tipping point for me where I was like, A, I'm ready to do my own thing. But way more importantly, it was just clear, like, I've been obsessed with hair my entire life. Yeah. It has always been like my final accessory, the thing that has given me self assurance. And it was just funny. I, it was, I was remember sending a list on a Google Doc to some of the Outdoor Voices girls mm-hmm. of like, you got to get this brush, you got to get this towel. How do you do your hair? What do you do? And that disconnect, like that awakening and light bulb moment of like, there's so many products out there. It's really been driven by Salon. All the products I'm recommending are like, at least a decade old from a formulation perspective and you know skincare and color like there's just so much out there there's been so much democratization with clean makeup it's like makeup formulated like skincare and I was like why don't I why are my choices either like salon brands that are probably not good for me or like straight up whole foods super pure but like my hair looks terrible we all know like your hair's got to look good yeah and also like you want the whole experience like it's I had the same thesis for Array as well right where I mean I saw this whole revolution happen in clean skincare and I was like this just doesn't exist in wellness and it's very like sterile and like why are these my options and I don't know your brain just gets going I first of all the category you're in truly is like a mystery to me because there's just so much junk in it It's really shocking, and you know this too. Like, once you start formulating product and developing product, you are just aghast at like what is in some things, and you're like, how are people like selling this to people? I remember we were talking about it at dinner, where you were like, like obviously we're not going to name any brands, but you're like, it's like I was shocked at like the brands that you were saying that just maybe not the best ingredients yeah (laughs) my analogy with beauty now is like I used to use cheese as an analogy and quality but I feel like the best analogy now is like a lot of beauty is giving jamba juice and it's like you want the air one smoothie you know what I mean yeah and it's like it's not that the jamba juice smoothie is not a smoothie but like you know that there's something better out there and then when you try it you're like oh wait these ingredients actually like give me benefits Mm -hmm. this thing's actually good for me you know and I feel like that's so much of these categories and Candidly, even I think when you have a vision as a founder, I Mm -hmm. see this with you and Array as well. It's like there can be a lot out there. But I think when you have a very clear vision and you're making it for you, there is so much room. Oh, 100 percent. Like I I think that there's only 
a brand can only be like that brand. Does that make sense? Like there's no yes. replication. It's just a second grade quality of what you're doing. So I feel like if your vision is clear and you're doing it with purpose and you know like what differentiates you and that you're not happy with what's on the market, what you produce is going to be something that resonates with other people. I just think that that's how the world works. Yeah, I could not agree more. Um, so talk to me about actually going from being like you were essentially an entrepreneur for a very long time like you worked at these like high paced startups and like just incredible brands that flourished in front of our eyes a lot of us right and how did you go from there to being an entrepreneur and like what would you say are the differences I will say I've always been someone who's like addicted to having a direct impact. Yeah. I have friends who I see thrive in corporate environments. Mm -hmm. They're amazing people managers. They love the structure. They like that. And they've tried startups and they're like, this is not for me. Personally, I love sitting with founders. I love getting into the trenches with people. And I love being like, I did this thing in January and it's rolling out in March and people are loving it. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm always going to be that person. In terms of actually taking the step to being like, okay, I can do this on my own, I use the analogy all the time. It's like, even though I was close to founders, it's, you just don't actually know what it's like being a founder. It's like when you think that you like you go to somewhere and people are speaking Spanish and you're like, I speak Spanish. Yeah. And then you're like, wait, I actually don't speak <laughs> Spanish. I like kind of understand it, but I don't speak this. That was my experience with finally becoming a founder. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for the decade plus of experience that I had before learning from other people, you know, learning how they hired, what they did, how they raised money. Like, I think it can be really, first of all, I mean, I graduated college in 2013, so the landscape was just different. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't have the opportunity. In I mean, I guess I did, but like, it was just, I didn't like wake up at 22 and be like, I'm going to be an influencer. I'm going to do this thing. Like, I just did a more traditional route. I do think having like a decade of experience of like structure, comms, KPIs, reporting, teamwork, like it just puts you in a different place. Also, like I'm more than learning what to do, I feel like I learned what not to do. Because the reality is I launched Crown Affairs six weeks before the pandemic. Oof, yeah. Which on one hand is like insane and I'm really grateful that we were able to be in the world for like a little. We actually came out to LA and did like a Create and Cultivate Summit. I got to meet people in person and then that March obviously everything started to shut down. Mm -hmm. Weirdly, I do feel like there's this before and after in terms of leadership where the before time was a lot of masculine energy. It was a lot of like bulldozing, move fast and break things, say yes to everything, go, go, go. The problem when you move fast and break things is they're not things, they're people. Yeah. And it just starts to fall apart. And I've been a part of those teams, whether it was from the eighth employee, the first employee, to all, all of a sudden, I'm up, a year later, I lift my head up and we're 100 people. Mm -hmm. And it just, the reality is that consumer is not scalable. And I think at that time, people were really viewing these, these businesses as tech companies. Yes. And it's just not how it works. Fast forward 10 years, obviously the internet's so different. You can't acquire customers from a paid perspective in the same capacity that you did 10 years ago. In addition to that, there's so much more choice. <laughs> like the amount of products, like just going back to Away, like if you type in Away right now, there's like 20 other luggage oh, yeah. brands. Yeah, like there, people are advertising on their name. Like it's crazy out there. Totally. And then a layer that in beauty, like it's just, oh, it's crazy now how many brands there are. So I think that for me, I feel really grateful that I'm able to like build a team and lead with feminine energy and like not splash and not push and be like, this is a journey. Um, but I feel like, I mean, so I've changed and grown so much through coaching and therapy and leadership and creating space for myself and my team and like truly genuinely trusting. I think that was the biggest thing. I worked under a lot of people who like believed in me and gave me chances, but you know, there's so much micromanagement and I think really in order to grow a business, you need to trust your team and you need to trust your partners. Um, so I kind of had that feeling too. I was like, I'm ready to like do this the way that I want to mm -hmm. do this versus like continuing to work and build other people's brands. I actually love that you had all of this experience before you dove in because I think this idea of like, you're an entrepreneur from day one and starting your brand. Like I feel like it's this like glamorized concept and fact of the matter is that having 
good leadership under someone else and really seeing how things are done, that can be very advantageous. And we can see that with a brand like yours. It's grown very fast and you've done a lot of things right. And it's because you've had this whole background that a lot of other people may not have had. And so I think stories like this are so important because it highlights the importance of having that experience. And it just allows you to not make as many mistakes as well, I feel like. One thousand percent. Like the amount of times people reach out and they're like, how did you do this? How did you? Because you're right. Like our whole brand pillar is around taking your time and like slowing down. At the same time, like a lot has happened in three and a half years. It is one thousand percent because like I've done a lot of these things Mm -hmm. before. And granted, like the landscape has changed. Nobody could have predicted the pandemic. Like so many new variables are very different. And I think there's the old playbook doesn't work anymore. But it's just about having experience and knowing when something comes your way, you're like, okay, I can figure out how to handle this. The other thing about being like a successful entrepreneur, and you know this, it's like the real thing of success is just showing up every day. Totally. Like it isn't about having like the final results. Obviously, we all hope to get there and that's like the vision Mm -hmm. and what we're trying to build. But it's a lot easier to like wake up every day and like put on the metaphorical gym go- clothes and go to the gym if it's you true. have 10 years of just like okay I can do another day like I don't know if I would have had the the ability to do that at like 24 you know well also I think it's the maturity of how you show up as a founder right and how you show up as a leader because I've I've had conversations with um, people on my team or like you know people from other team like who've worked at startups and a lot of the times I'll hear stories that they tell me about other founders who were maybe like a lot younger and it's it's not their fault but like what how you behave and how you conduct yourself at 21 is just inherently different from 30 or 28 or 20 you know what I mean like it's just you're a different person I'm a totally different person and it's so funny a couple of things one I've been with my husband now for 10 years mm-hmm. so I met him at 22 wait we have the same life we both graduated I... 2013 <laughs> yeah Nish and I have been together for 11 so like almost yeah. right there with you like yeah. both launched in 2020 what the heck <laughs> wait that actually is so crazy yeah what I didn't realize the universe is just aligning us I love it <laughs> um I do feel obvi- obviously I'm not the same woman mm-hmm. at 22 as I am at 32 I'm sure you feel the same and you grow together and I think there's a couple things one you could be super young like I look at my team who's 22 23 and I'm like wow they know so many things I do not know you guys are incredible it's all about the life you want to build totally like if you're young and you have an idea and you want to create a business and be an entrepreneur and like heat up quick and make a ton of cash or sell the company like that's one way to Mm -hmm. build a business and there's nothing wrong with that For me, I really want to build a timeless brand. Yeah. And I think we've seen this with everything. It's like you heat up really quick. You can burn really quickly too. So for me, it's just about building something that like in 10 years, I can be like, wow, this is something I've really built, Um, which is a different approach. And you take a different strategy and you build a team differently. If you're like, I want to build something quick. I'm going to like hack and gamify the system. Let's go do that Mm -hmm. I think it's really important as an entrepreneur to have clarity on like how you want to live your life yeah and it's really important to not look and keep your blinders up because as many businesses as there are there is many ways to run a business the other thing I've learned now like doing this is like you have no idea what's going on under the hood like something (laughs) could look insane amazing dope incredible but it's like there are so many metrics whether it's top line revenue EBITDA like just focus on your own stuff as a founder entrepreneur whether you're 15 50 whatever age you are you know yeah it's something that I like I'm someone who just never looks at what other people are doing because I know that's something that looks shiny from the outside sometimes it is shiny on the inside but sometimes it's not you know and so I'm like listen I'm just gonna do my own thing and crush whatever I can and not let everything else kind of distract me you know I love shiny on the inside I love that (laughs) that's so good (laughs) so something that like as we have this conversation I think a word that comes to mind as you like tell me all of this is sustainability you know Mm -hmm. sustainability when you are operating as a founder you're not out here to burn yourself out and like die 
along the way. You know, you want to enjoy the journey. And something you mentioned before was that you want it, you want to run your company as well from like feminine energy, not just masculine energy. Can you share a little bit more about that for other founders who may be feeling like they need to constantly be in their masculine in order to um, succeed? Yes. First of all, if you are living in your masculine energy, please know that it is not your fault. The entire world and the society is rooted from that place of like, in order to achieve, I need to bulldoze. In order to achieve, I need to be the the strongest or the loudest person in the room. In order to achieve, I need to do more. And the truth is, is there's so much power in giving space to things. And someone once told me, they're like, let the silence do the work. Often, especially as women, I think we tend to talk and go and do, and it's like, Sometimes giving space to things is so much more powerful. And when it comes to feminine energy, I have an incredible coach. Her name is Tammy. She has opened my world. I've been working with her for about three years. She calls it the no splashing zone. She's like, you're going down a river. Why freak out? Like, why splash and create all this chaos? Like, just let it be. And it's interesting. I'll give you a great example because it happened this week. And, like, me three years ago would have been like, what happened? What did this do? Blah, blah, blah. Our team accidentally sent out an email that had lorem ipsum in it, which we've never done before, by the way. We've never done this before. And, like, shout out to my team for never doing it. And the old me would have been, like, what happened? Blah, blah, blah. Coming from a place of, like, shame, fear. A lot masculine energy is often rooted in, like, fear to get results. I just don't think it garners the best results in this day and age because it's not sustainable. People end up being unhappy. People end up feeling so shameful. I only know this because it took me so long to unlearn that Mm -hmm. and put so much time, energy, work into being like, wow, the way that I was trained on one hand really got me to a level of excellence. But on the other hand, it's like not sustainable. Everyone was burnt out. Nobody wanted. It was just terrible. So the truth is, is like what got you where you are isn't going to get you where you need to go. And I think I woke up to that a long time ago and was like, I need to change the way that I'm talking to myself in my head. I need to change the way that I, like, communicate. Thank goodness, like, I had two people on my team when COVID happened. Mm -hmm. So every single hire we've made has been, like, hybrid work-life balance. Like, nobody's left our company. It's, like, crazy. Just, like, the energy, the retention. And it's funny, when we're around other teams, my team is always, like, thank you. Because I think the other thing that's unique is, like, I've been all the girls on my team. I've been the marketing coordinator. I've been the marketing assistant. I've been the this. So I, like, have so much empathy for where they're coming from, and Mm -hmm. I never want them to feel – I just want them to be their best. So I don't know. It's something I'm learning every day, and there's definitely challenges when you start to work with bigger partners or grow the business. And the truth is I have a lot of role models I look to, and a lot of them are my former CEOs. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say I have any role models when it comes to building a business and also having balance. And I would say my personal – my personal life mission is being a role model for not only myself but for other women to be like I can live in Miami and have a beautiful partnership with my husband and really empower my team and build an incredible business that's like growing and having all this opportunity because it really felt like you had to choose one and it's just not the vibe anymore I mean it's (laughs) like it really isn't and the thing is that I'm with you like I want to take my time to build a ray like nish and i have talked about this right where it's like uh, so many founders have this conversation i mean sell the business and then what what do you do after that like what's the (laughs) next thing right and the fact of the matter is like unless you're planning to retire in like the countryside in italy which if you do that good for you good for you (laughs) the next thing you do will probably also be something that you're gonna have to work and you know like you're gonna have to work for and there's gonna be periods of stress and so you may as well enjoy the journey for this one because you're just gonna want to replicate it in a different form in the future you know totally it's really funny I'm staying right now with my friend Steven who's a very successful tech entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and he's working on a new project and he was taking me through his journey and his work and he was literally saying this last night and we were talking about it because he's like he's like I want to sit in this world of what I'm building for the next like three to five years like, what's the rush? And I feel that way with Crown Affair. Like, and I think this is the tricky thing as entrepreneurs is like, you keep, as much as you're like, okay, I'm going to sell the business and whatever, it's like, you're going to keep building. Exactly. It's, it's in your blood. Yeah. You know, like, I'm not just going to, I'm not going to not do this. Yeah. And so it's like, <laughs> I'm going to enjoy it while I'm doing it 
every single time, you know, yeah. whether I run array for life or I sell it, yeah. like I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to enjoy it. And the way to do that is to enjoy it along the way. It's not just one fine day. It's going to be the best day ever. You know what I mean? You need totally. to find ways to make it sustainable, to have a life outside of just your business. And also, like I've talked about this, but I think it's very tough on someone to have their business be their their entire identity right it's just it's such pressure it's such a roller coaster and so array is like one part of my identity but right. there's more to me and i need to nurture those parts too well and totally that's why the journey is so important because like i've done the exercise with myself where i'm like okay let's say crown affair like shut down tomorrow mm -hmm. i think is every founder needs to be like my company for whatever reason and you need to be so present and be like what am i proud of like what what's the impact and what's the legacy that I've had and for me like especially early on where we were really in the early building stages I was like seedling our mentorship program like even if this all just has to shut down tomorrow like the impact that seedling has had on our 400 mentors and mentees like people have found jobs people have found roommates people have moved across the country like that alone and that community to me is like such a huge part of the legacy of what we're building and then of course it's like I don't know. There's just something. It's like you want to live in the world and the universe you're creating, and it still feels so early. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you're right. It's like you have to prioritize and find value in other things because the reality is, is like your relationships, your partnerships, your family, your hobbies. You know, taking care of yourself. Like those are going to be the things that get you through. Like I truly would not be the person I am without Alex. Without journaling, almost yeah. Oh every my gosh, day. I'm obsessed with journaling too. It's life changing. It, it, truly, life changing. I love. Str I'll stretch for ten minutes a day. I listen to poetry. I did this exercise years ago that I wrote down my life in like five year increments. I was like zero to five, five to ten, ten to fifteen, and so on and so on. I think I wrote it out to one twenty, which was very optimistic of me. <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy, and I just wrote down like the core things in my life during those five years. So like as a kid, it's like your family and sports and maybe there's an activity or something and then as you get older you're like okay I'm in high school and call you know getting into college was a big deal and then when you're in college it was this thing it's interesting to look at your life in five year increments in terms of like what are the big identifiers of those windows and I think I wrote through like 45 or something I was like crown affair like this is going to be a part of my universe and I, I hope it's always a part of my identity, but it's like you look at the rest of the page and there's the page is still half empty, yeah. you know? And it's like, okay, what are those little seeds that I want to plant? So when I'm 50 or 60, I'm really doing the work there. And I think having that perspective of like, this is the now, I'm in the journey. There's also something else mm -hmm. allows you to like kind of release a little bit of pressure. And sometimes pressure is good, but I also feel like it's just not a sustainable way to live every day, being so hard on yourself or feeling like you have all your eggs in this one basket. Yeah. Um, I know for me, like, I just have so many data points for, like, when I give myself a little bit of space, I actually perform better. Okay, yes. Yeah. A hundred percent, yes. And I don't think that people give this enough importance, but, yeah. like, I, I was talking about it on stories because I just got back from Italy, right? Yeah. And I feel like a different person. Yeah. I have so many ideas. Like, I feel like I'm operating at like 150%. Like, and people sometimes go for like a whole year without even taking a day off. It's like, what are you even accomplishing? Like, are you, are you well? Like, it is, the, to, first of all, it is like the most amount of rewiring I've had to do. And now I'm like, I'm going off. I, I go off the grid for like two weeks when I go to Burning Man. I'm just like fully out. And then I come back and I'm like, my brain is working again. You know, and obviously there's so many layers to this with like social media and email. I was just saying with my team the other day, I was like, I don't know where you sent me this thing on because there's eight different communication oh, yeah. so much. <laughs> opportunities. And I think you need to step away and like structure the rest. And fortunately, as the business has grown, I'm sure you felt this as well. Like as you get more team and the company grows, like – what I was doing in the early days was a lot more like I'm working all the time. And now it's like, let me actually give my morning to myself. I have this thing called calendar mapping mm -hmm. where I block out sections of my day. And obviously, like, I don't always abide to it. It's tough. Things come up, whatever it is. But, like, I take time to, like, just be creative and give myself space and don't let things happen. because, And also figuring out your own personal rhythms. Like, I'm not a morning person. So I need a lot of time in the morning or like I love working at night. Mm -hmm. Like it just genuinely am creative then. So it's like figuring out how to structure your days, 
I take like Mondays off sometimes. I'm just like, I'm taking this Monday to like put a mood board together and you just, it's the only sustainable way I think mm-hmm. to like build and grow. Well, I think also if you want to be creative, like your creative mind isn't just this like machine, you know, you actually have to let it play and wander in order to actually have those really good ideas. And people don't block off time for that. You know what I mean? Like they yeah. think that they're constantly ha- like you you put this pressure on yourself to constantly do. And like w- when when we're in our business, like we're working in our business, but like when you take that time away, it's like your time to kind of like have that bird's eye view and reflect and work on the business, you know, or have related ideas that maybe you can apply or whatever it is. Yeah. It's all about the rest and recovery and taking time and finding that space for yourself because you're right. Otherwise you don't connect the dots. And it goes back to the masculine energy of yeah. like doing, doing, doing versus like, let me just sit and be. There's so much science around this, whether it's meditation or journaling totally. and like whatever you need to do for you, do it. Mm-hmm. Even if it feels like you're not being productive, you are being productive. Yeah. Yeah. You know? I couldn't agree more. So you mentioned Seedling, which is obviously your mentorship program. And I think a through line that I see with you is your ability to cultivate community. Okay. Like I think you've just done a phenomenal job with it, both with Crown Affair, with Seedling, I think throughout your whole career. Yeah. Right. So can you share some tangible tips with our audience to kind of how to how to cultivate good community? Yeah. I think the first thing is just being curious. Like I genuinely love learning about people and hearing about people and listening to people. So say yes to th- the first tip is actually just say yes to things. I feel like in my 20s in particular, I just like went to everything. Like I went to parties, I went to events, I connected with people. I know it's so tempting to have those like I'm gonna stay in and get in a little infrared sauna blanket and like drink my tea and watch a Netflix show. But the truth is, especially in your 20s, like get out there, say yes. Be brave. Talk to people. Get out of your comfort zone if you're not an extrovert. It's truly worth it because the number of people I've met during that time in my life that are still in my life in some capacity, you see them come around again. It's genuinely wild, truly. So say yes to things. Get out there and meet people I think is the first thing. Not just on the internet. It hits different, as we all know. The second thing I would say is, like, be intentional about when you're with somebody. Like, take notes after like remember what you're talking to them about because especially as you meet more and more people like you just really need to like be intentional about caring for people I know that's just like it's a general thing but like if someone's telling you about their job or they're telling you about their family or they're telling you about a side project they're working on like whether it goes through or not just like keep in mind these touch points for people I think it's really important um the third thing I would say like Honestly, so this is why social media has been great. It's so funny that like Instagram wasn't really a thing when I started my career, but I feel like supporting people, like if you see a friend or a friend of a friend do something cool, like comment, engage, share, like people want to be a part, people want to support what they're part of creating. So like it can feel, especially as a woman, I feel like we're all like secret perfectionists and you don't want to like put the thing out there, but like get coffee with the person, tell them about what you're building, listen to what they're building. When you actually launch the thing, they're going to be like, I was a part of that. And I think that's the big insight because it's not like I was like had a huge audience digitally or I had like a YouTube channel or was an influencer. I'm obviously not a celebrity, spoiler alert. Like, (laughs) you know, I didn't actually have like a community to show to an investor and be like, hey, here's my 5 million followers. I was like, here's the thousands of conversations I've had over the last decade with people and these are real people in my phone book so when I like go to market and launch a thing like that I I feel like the intimacy of those relationships is so much more powerful and I'll just say anecdotally like there's people that I've just been friends with on social for the last five years or whatever and it's not the same depth so like really make the time to get coffee like really make the time to see people in person and just be human with them, you know, be vulnerable. I think that's like the last thing, which is years of therapy and work, but like, it's okay to be vulnerable Mm -hmm. and be honest with people. Like, and again, this goes back to the male versus female. Like, don't just show up and be like, everything's amazing, I'm crushing it, this is great, which used to kind of be the vibe in like the early 2010s. The girl bossing. (laughs) I've always been like not into the girl bossing personally. I'm into like the girl resting is what I'm into. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I just feel like, be honest, be vulnerable. People connect with that so much more. I, I mean, 
I think like it is the way to connect with people, right? Yeah. Because we're all human at the end of the day. And I, I think like also that's where the world is going, where people are tired of seeing <laughs> perfection. It simply does not exist. And why pretend? It's also, exhausting. by the way, this is hard. Like I can look you in the eyes right now and be like, how hard is it to do this? It's fucking hard, it's man. So it's hard. so hard. <laughs> people need to know that this is hard. Like, I feel like we grew up in a time where it was like, oh, this is so, look how glamorous. She looks amazing. And don't get me wrong. There are moments where it's like, wow, I might get my makeup done and speak on a stage. But like most of the time it's not that. And by the way, I love sitting on the floor and just cranking on stuff. And it's like so competitive out there. Like you really have to want to do this. And when you find other people like yourself who really want to do this and have a mission for their why, you can then look at each other and be like, wow, this is the most, this is the greatest blessing. I can't believe we get to sit in this and do this every day. Also, this is really hard to do. You yeah. Know? I mean, this is why, like, I've, I've talked about this, but I think it's so important to have other people in your universe who understand you and are honest that you can lean on when times are good but also when times are bad you know and I think I don't know it just offers such support and I don't think it's spoken about enough in the context of entrepreneurs how lonely it can be and how important it is to have a community because otherwise it's incredibly isolating a thousand percent and it's like all the you know we're all going through different ebbs and flows like for example you or me or I know we both know Lindsay from set like she'll be crushing and I'm like trying to figure something out mm -hmm. and then I call her and she gives me the boost of energy or then she's trying to figure something out whatever it is with the business and I'm like wow we're in a really good pocket right now with Crown Affair and it's like you're on this journey together you're all having different ups and downs so to be able to call people when you're down and then to be able to be like dude you're crushing it on social or whatever when they're up is like it's both it's not just the like everything's great Cause, no because it's not and we're all people and I think in general, I think outside of just being an entrepreneur, you know, social media for a long time, for like a decade, you just see these snapshots of people's lives. But like subconsciously, like we all know that we're humans, like we're all going through highs and lows. So it's also, just, yeah. again, rewiring of being like, I know that everybody's feeling that being a human is so hard. Like, like we're all going through this and like, it's not normal. Even with therapy and coaching, it's like, I remember when I first started this process years ago, I was like, when am I going to be better? Like, am I, am I fixed? Like, what's up? And I'm like, oh, wait, this is life's work. And I'm going to keep evolving and growing. And I think just, like, being graceful to yourself, being graceful to other people, like, know that it's really hard and just people aren't sharing every detail of that is yeah. important to know. Love. Um, so before we wrap, there's actually a lot of audience questions that we got. And they're hair related. Okay? Oh, this like is what, let's hardcore go. <laughs> hair. So I was like, I have to leave a chunk of time aside because it's a lot of hair questions, okay? So number one, is the rosemary oil slash water trend a fact or myth? Two okay. thoughts there. First of all, Oh my god, I'm so excited. By the way, my <laughs> life is either like entrepreneur questions or hair questions, <laughs> and I never know which way and, and conversations. <laughs> I love that we're doing both today. Okay. You are the expert on your hair, yeah. and you know your hair the best. The first thing is let's separate scalp care from strand care. Mm -hmm. They are different things. The way that you take care of your scalp, it's like a very intuitive process, and like rosemary oil might be great for you. It might be amazing. It might actually cause irritation for some people. Like every product, every ingredient is so specific. My advice is try it. Mm -hmm. Do a little test patching. See if it works. The main reality of hair care, and this is the whole ethos of Crown Affair, is consistency. There are a lot of products out there that are immediate fixes, four-minute miracles, bond repair, whatever it is. And it's like, let's get to the root of the damage to mm -hmm. begin with. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big advocate for consistent rituals. So if rosemary your hair and doing like the spray bottle or the little oil with the dropper works for you. The other thing is like be focused on your goals. I think, for example... We're launching a new scalp product that we just announced yesterday with Sephora. We're launching a scalp serum <gasps> on July 4th. And it is unbelievable for a number of reasons. It's cooling. It's calming. It focuses on itchiness, irritation, scalp issues. A lot of products try to do the most. They try to do that, and they try to do growth and thinning. They try to do whatever. And it's like focus on the results of a specific product and what it's trying to do. So with the rosemary thing, if you're really focused on growth, start there. Mm-hmm. The only thing I will say is there's a lot of scalp oiling and it does not make your hair look good. Like it doesn't give you what you want. So 
I don't know. I'm all about working with incredible chemists to like formulate products, whether it's like our hair gel or it's like it holds, but you can brush it out Mm -hmm. or our dry shampoo. Like the other last thing I'll say too is holistic sustainability, like holistically thinking about your hair. So like if you're doing rosemary oil, but then also like spraying intense, harsh, dry shampoo on your hair follicles at your root, like less is more. Take a look at your entire routine. Quick fixes are usually not the answer. What are you doing for your personal hair routine? Because obviously it looks insane. <laughs> I'm and on day five right now the, of my hair. Oh, my God. Okay, yeah, you got you to gotta tell us what's going on because that Ooh. looks like a fresh wash right there. It is, it is a journey. I mean, honestly, it's all the little touch points from using the hair towel. There's a million hair towels out there. You can go on Amazon, type in hair towel. Ours, it's different. We have a patent on it. The fabric, the way that it feels, it just, like, it soaks dampness out of your hair in a different way. Your hair is a fiber. It's very vulnerable when it's wet. Depending on your hair type, you either want to like lock in moisture. So if you have textured hair, you want to like lock in that moisture. If you have like fine or straight hair, you want to make sure that you're not like holding in moisture. It'll look really heavy. Mm -hmm. So it's just about taking time to be like, what's working for your hair? Personally, I have fine hair. I have a fair amount of it. I have wavy hair. So I have a whole routine where like what I use in shower really matters for my scalp and moisturizing. I rinse it out, do my towel. Then I do the leave-in conditioner, which... If you're not using a leave-in, ours is incredible if you have fine and thin hair. It does not weigh the hair down or, like, loosen the style at all. I love a leave-in. It is literally moisturizer for your hair. Like, Wait, you, do I need to start using a leave-in? You are going to change your life using okay. a leave-in. <laughs> I use the leave-in, and then I use the, the oil to lock it in. Like an occlu- It's an okay, occlusive. I have to say yeah. this on, <laughs> on, the, on live, okay? I've talked about this on stories. Your oil is fucking phenomenal okay i have it on my hair i air dry my hair sometimes now because i use that oil and i like it like really cuts down the frizz like my frizz used to be so bad yeah it was like impossible to air dry quality ingredients man that's the answer there's only five ingredients in that and they're super clean they just work i always say it's like a five ingredient i'd rather have a five ingredient salad than a 26 ingredient salad it's the same with supplements so i feel this you know you get it i always love talking to people who make product because i'm like (laughs) you know what's in this stuff so yeah i love a leave-in it's literally like if you cleanse your face and you don't put moisturizer on you really want to lock that in your hair is going to be totally different if you're using products like this so that's my holy grail i do maintenance with my scalp i'll use our scalp serum i don't have scalp issues usually i did burn my scalp the other day in miami and was like <gasps> spraying it on and you don't have to wash it out it's a mist or application a lot of scalp serums are like droppers and you yeah. have to do a wa- you know rinse your hair after their pre-shampoo products so i love that ours is like a face mist for your scalp and it's like all of our products are rooted in how you actually live your life like mm-hmm. I don't wash my hair every day like I want to be able to put dry shampoo in and I want to be able to use a scalp serum and I want to be able to put leave in and dry hair and then my wash day ritual and then I'd say 80% of the time I do air dry with my little twist and clip technique mm-hmm. and then 20% of the time I'm using like a hot tool or a styler because I have an event or a wedding or whatever so it's just balance like you can't be perfect all the time but I like finding balance with it and it's about consistency and rituals instead of like overnight miracles love okay so someone on that air drying convo someone actually someone on my team has asked how can someone go from blow drying hair to air drying hair is there a phased approach that you would recommend okay it really depends on your hair type Uh i would say get a hair towel and get a leave-in conditioner and get some clips is what I would do. Your hair's just a shape on your head. So knowing how your hair holds texture, you wanna have the right tools and the right formulas to like give your hair a vibe. Mm -hmm. I prefer that. You can also just like air dry and not do anything and see how it goes. Maybe you start there. So you like identify and get to know your hair. This is a journey. Like it's trial and error. It's not gonna be perfect the first time. I would say if you really like have to rely on blow drying your hair, or you're like, I can't walk out of the house without this. Start by looking at your shampoo. Not enough people look at that. Most shampoos still have sulfates, and if they don't have sulfates, they have pegs in them. Mm -hmm. They overstrip the scalp. It's like when you have a cleanser that makes your face really tight and you end up overproducing oil. Like that is what's happening with a lot of shampoos. So a naturally derived surfactant system, a conditioner that doesn't weigh your hair down, rinse it out, put a towel in. That's going to totally – don't, like, try to rough dry your hair or just let your hair dry damp. It's just different. You need it. Put a little leave-in and just let it happen. See what the vibe is. And don't 
hate yourself. Obviously, it's not going to look the same as if you're blow drying your hair at the root. Just see what it's like. And then honestly, for the person on your team, have them DM me or my team and we can kind of guide them in the right direction based off their hair. But then maybe the second time that you air dry, like, and by the way, it's not a crime if you like air dry and then you use like a little bit of a hot tool to maybe style the front pieces or mm-hmm. whatever it is. But it's just about balance. Is Tatiana, the whole thing. you hear that? That's yeah, your tip. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And also, like, a braid might work well for her. I don't know. Like, mm-hmm. it's just about trying different techniques. Talk to me about this towel because you're really mm-hmm. selling it to me. Like, <laughs> what? What's what's the deal with the towel, Diana? <laughs> Here's the whole thing. It's so funny. When I was first working on the business, I was at a wedding with my friend Dave, who has a sock company called Bombas, and I was like, Dave. Oh, Nish is obsessed with okay. it's only on his feet. Like, I think he wears it every day. Bombas and Buck Mason. We're gonna get the boy <laughs> hooked up. Um, okay, I was like, Dave, how do you sell socks? Like, everyone has a drawer of socks. Like, there's a million socks on Amazon, and he's like, it's all about pointing out the things that people didn't know they needed. Because he knows his sock is better. And when you try it, I'm sure Nish is like, yeah. this is he's, better. He was saying that yesterday. He's like, this is fantastic. I was like, what? He's like, the socks I'm wearing. <laughs> you literally, I totally get it. Because I feel like I sound like a crazy person when I talk about a hair towel. And I'm sure Nish is like, they're socks. Like, it's not. <laughs> but honestly, when you take the time to, like, innovate on everyday products. So for the socks, it was, Dave was saying, seamless toe. The second you like, oh, wait, this sock has a seam on the toe. It's so uncomfortable. Like, the arch support. Like, oh my things cut like you just notice all these things and I had other hair towels like you know them I won't name names Mm -hmm. but there's like very known hair towels and a couple things one they always most of them weren't long enough or they were like a turban twisty style so yeah it would drive me insane I'm like like, what's this gonna do for me silly button in the back it's falling off my head it's lopsided it's also not like covering the right amount of surface area on my hair to dry it like my wet hair was on my wet hair in this little twisty thing yeah and then the the towel itself would be so it would be this like wet sock on my head it's literally a wet sock on your head it's also not cute like the whole part of creating a habit and a ritual is like looking forward to it and it's like the last thing I wanted to do was look at this like little thing hanging on the back of my you know it just wasn't cute a lot of these towels the ones that aren't the twisty style but like the long rectangular ones They look like car wash towels after the fifth wash. They would have like an ugly orange tag, whatever. It's just like not cute. Also, I realized that the rectangular ones that were long, you actually don't, your head's round. Mm -hmm. You actually don't need the top two triangles at the top of the fabric. So it was all this added fabric and weight that wasn't actually adding any benefits or surface area. So it was one of the first things I did. I literally filed a patent with the US Patent Office and was like, I I wanna own this shape of towel. It's a little subtle thing. I owe it to my husband because I'm like, explaining to him and he's like like it's literally like using using a meat thermometer like you can cook meat without a meat thermometer but when you use it you're like oh wait I'm dialed now yeah and I feel like that's what it is with the hair towel when you try this one it's like so much lighter on your head it has a strap in the back we were one of the first to put the straps in the back and it's longer it actually covers all your hair and it also just gives you like a little bit of a spa moment like I'll put it on and I'll do my five minute journal or put it on and I'll make a little avocado and egg or I don't know it's like this beautiful moment for me where I'm like this is my time out Mm -hmm. and then I take it out my hair's partial dry I can actually start to put product in it and it like holds and applies better it's like it seems silly right like getting a sock but like it just makes your life better and it hits different than all the other ones on the market, truly. Okay, I But other it. people will tell you that. I'm telling you that because I love it, but, like, truly, there was an amazing girl online who did a test of, like, 20 different hair towels and don't know this person. I think she's, mm-hmm. like, somewhere in Michigan. I have no idea who she is. Crown of hair towel number one. I, I got to try the towel. Yeah, got to get you the towel, girl. Like, like <laughs> truly. Um, okay, and the last question is, what are some hair growth myths? Ooh, Myths. Well, the first thing is like that you can fix it overnight. The truth is hair growth, somewhere along the way we got lost that hair is just about how your hair looks and we kind of forgot that it's actually a reflection of our Mm well-being. So I think like we've been trained pretty well that like if you have acne, like of course you want to like solve it and mask it, but you're also like, did I eat some dairy? Or like, am I hormonal? Like for me, I've been so trained with when I break out that I understand it's a reflection of something happening with my hormones and my well-being. And for some reason with hair, like we haven't taken the time to be like, is there something happening? Mm-hmm. Am I getting older? Did I just have a baby? Like it first and foremost is a reflection of your well-being. So I would say start there mm-hmm. because 
You can try to put a ton of rice water on it or rosemary oil or whatever it is. A, it might work really well for you. It might not work at all. And honestly, you have to be consistent with it. It's mm-hmm. not going to happen overnight. Um, so that's the first thing. I don't really know if that's a myth, but it's like the best place to start. Mm-hmm. I do believe in like topical for I believe in like being kind to yourself and shifting your mindset. You see these results with like nutrition. Like totally. Dieting and restriction is not a long-term solution. Instead of feeling shameful and hard on yourself, be like, okay, my hair isn't totally the way I want to, but I'm going to like give myself little scalp massages and I'm going to like prioritize my sleep and I'm going to drink water and like be kind to it, take care of it. I think brushing, I, well here's a myth. People think that brushing is bad for you. Mm -hmm. It obviously depends on your hair type, but if you have straight and wavy hair, people get afraid to brush Mm because they're like, I'm going to lose hair if I brush. You're going to naturally lose 50 to 100 strands a day. You have 100 to 150,000 hair strands on your head. You're fine. You're fine. Like 50 is okay, and it can be shocking when you get out of the shower. That being said, if you're like seeing clumps come out, like go to the inside. Be like, what is happening? Is this something going on internally? But if you're losing like 50 to 100 strands, like don't freak out. Mm -hmm. Brushing your hair is so good for the health of your hair. It moves the natural healthy oils from the scalp down to the strand. It helps stimulate growth. It like polishes your hair. Like the princess, like Rapunzel, like brush, you know, do a thousand strokes. Don't do a thousand strokes. It's a little (laughs) excessive. But like I really do believe in taking two to three minutes at night brushing through your hair. For me, I'll put a little dry shampoo in after, and then I wake up and my hair looks amazing. Wait, you brush your hair every day? Uh, Not every day, but dry hair at night. Not on my wash day, but Mm -hmm. like day two, three, four. Okay. Like tonight I'll brush, I'm flying out tomorrow, but like tonight I will brush my hair for at least three minutes. And like, if I decided to not brush my hair, and you just don't do that for a long period of time, your hair's not going to be as healthy and look as good and be as shiny. So brushing, if you have hair that you can brush, like you should be brushing it with a dual bristle brush. This is the whole concept of like the Mason Pearson. It's Mm -hmm. like brushing for health, not just style, will help your hair grow. And I think people are a little afraid that it's going to like rip their hair out. No, I I find that it's very therapeutic. I just can't do it on the first day. Yeah, no, 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 not day. And by the way, there's people who don't do it on till day three. Yeah. You just, there is not one formula. And that's why you have to like shift your mindset and open up the space to be like, Yes, yeah, someone can give me advice, but I got to, like, figure this out on my own. A hundred percent. Diana, this has been awesome. Tell everyone where they can find you. I adore you so much. This is so fun. I feel like we could do five more hours oh, right 100%. now. Oh, 100 percent. I'm, like, looking at the time, like, what? How did that I happen? I have to do another one. <laughs> I don't know. You guys, you can find us on crownaffair.com. Also, Crown Affair on all the social channels. I am at Diana Cohen. Diana with two N's. My mom did that. Don't know why, but we love it. Um, and then you can shop us at Sephora, at Goop, at Violet Gray, at G Beauty, Moda Operandi, all the fun places that we love shopping. So. Love. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me.